whatever it is that gives you joy, you need to find joy every single day and make that a priority in your life. It's the Health in the Real World podcast. It's time to start the show with Chris Jenke as your host. Here to give you everything that you need when it comes to fitness strategies. We keep it simple and easy. It's your roadmap to get healthy. You don't need equipment and you don't need a gym. Just the right strategies to get you fit and trim. The Health in the Real World podcast is sponsored by... Choosing the right workout program is important, but the most important success factor is lacing up your shoes and going to the gym. This book is less about what to do and more about how to do it and how to be consistent. Go to the gym, practical strategies to get off the couch and start building fitness momentum. This is my book. It's available on Amazon. Go to the gym. Hello and welcome to Health in the Real World. I'm Chris Jenke and I'm joined today by Sarah Anderson. Sarah is a uh, nurse practitioner and functional medicine health coach. Sarah, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? It's so great to be here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great to meet you. And uh, tell everybody a little bit more detail about kind of who you are and and what specifically you help people with. So I am a nurse practitioner. I've been a nurse practitioner for about 10 years, and I've been in conventional medicine for about 20 years. But a couple years ago, I started realizing that inflammation is the root cause of all the things. Specifically, I work in cardiovascular medicine. So I see, or I have seen a lot of people with heart failure and heart attacks and arrhythmias and things like that. Um, but inflammation is again, the root cause of everything. And so I started having these light bulb moments of how do we reduce inflammation? And that's how I came to functional medicine. Um, And so I wanted to find a better way to help people because sometimes in cardiology clinic, I don't feel like I am helping people the way I would ultimately love to. Um, And so I started my own company, Peak Integrative Wellness. And there we help people really kind of uh, sort through some of these things and find their peak state of health, um, where they can truly thrive in their life. And that's more of the functional medicine side, right? Cause the functional medicine is not really, I mean, you guys don't really practice that in sort of like the mainstream nurse practitioner, right? No, yeah. we don't. Yeah. So, so functional medicine, um, is different from conventional medicine in that we're really looking for the root cause of illness. So instead of saying, Oh, you're feeling depressed. Here's a depression pill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, why are you feeling depressed? What's going on in your life and kind of understanding that piece or your thyroid is out of whack. Well, why is your thyroid out of whack? Not here, take a supplement or, you know, medication, pharmaceutical, um, you know, well, what's going on with your diet, what's going on with your hormones and kind of really digging deep to figure out what is going on underneath the surface that is causing your body to develop hypothyroidism. Right now, I I do want to get to the point, um, toward the end of this conversation, as far as what you believe the reasons why mainstream medicine hasn't adopted this yet. But first I'd like to really focus on how we can help people. So inflammation, you said, is like sort of the root cause of everything. And we were talking about three symptoms that people may, and it's highly likely that they experience on a day-to-day level um, or a day-to-day occurrence, fatigue, stress, and brain fog. So can we go through, we'll go through each of these, but again, we're talking that the root of all these inflammations. So we'll talk a little bit about how these may manifest and then sort of dig down into the root as far as how functional medicine can maybe alleviate some or all of that inflammation. Yes. Yeah. So it's really interesting. Again, in my cardiology world, I'm seeing people for cardiac complaints, but really when I dig deep and I talk with them about what's going on in their life, their biggest concerns are not their heart their biggest concerns are stress, brain fog, and the fatigue that they're experiencing. They're so tired. They can't play with their kids at night. Their brains aren't working. They can't function well at work. They can't remember what their boss asked them to do or why they went into the room to get something. Um, And they just feel this overwhelming stress. And it doesn't matter whether they work at the post office or Amazon or, you know, they're president of their company, like they feel stressed all the time. Um, and it really, it drives disease. It drives illness, um, in, in their life. Yeah. 
so that so that stress that sort of like over scheduling right that so many people you know they're, they're like at 110 percent of their bandwidth and they do that for years and years and then uh you know turning to things like coffee and other stimulants like that and not sleeping enough. So what are some of the, what are some of the questions you start out with to somebody who maybe is fatigued, stressed, or has that brain fog? What sort of, what direction do you go with them to uncover maybe the root of what's going on? So we really kind of sit down and we talk about what's going on in their life. You know, what symptoms are they really experiencing? Because there is a stress curve. Are you on the burnout end of stress or are you in the functional area of stress? Not all stress is bad. In fact, we need stress in our life in order to function. You know, if it's, it's, we're hungry, that's a stressor on our body. It tells us to go get food. Um, then the choice becomes, you choose something that feeds your body to, to nourish it, or do you choose something that is going to cause inflammation in the body and cause disease? Um, and that's kind of where the inflammation piece comes in. Also chronic stress uh, is regulated by something called the HPA axis is a hypoth- um, hypothalamus pituitary Um, adrenal access, and this regulates all the hormones in our body. And so when you're in a constant stress state, you can get cortisol imbalance as well as other hormonal imbalances that trigger inflammation throughout the body as well. Um, So bringing that down to a practical level of where do we begin with all this is what is your current level of stress? You know, what is stressing you out? Are you able to sleep? Are you able to, um, calm down enough to have a cognitive reaction to a stressor that's going on, your kids fighting, are you yelling at them because you're so stressed out? Or are you able to take a moment to breathe and say, okay, what is really going on here? Let's, you know, let's all take a minute and calm down and figure out it's not the end of the world that she's playing with your toy. (laughs) Um, And so we take a step back from all that and we figure out what is really going on. We can also measure hormone levels to help us not only determine based on symptoms, but what are your hormone levels doing? Is your cortisol rock bottom? So you really can't get out of bed, which is leading to further stress, fatigue, and then brain fog. We can also measure um, inflammatory markers like CRP and homocysteine. If those are off the charts, you know, it's it indicates that there is inflammation in the body and it can, and, um, you know, so it's some way to quantitatively measure what's going on. Right. Right. So what are some daily practices that somebody could do? Let's say they do get to that point where maybe they notice, Oh my gosh, I just snapped at my kid again. Like something's <laughs> going on. Like, uh, what, what are some daily habits? Cause obviously, you know, once you start yelling at your kid over, you know, they're just fighting over a, a doll or something you know, like, okay, well, I'm already kind of pretty far down this rabbit hole. Let me pull back a little bit and do what, what would you recommend they start doing? You know, it's very, this is a very interesting question and it has taken me a long time to figure out the answer to this. Um, and if it's okay, I'll share a quick story. (laughs) Of course. Yeah. Um, so my oldest daughter has autism. And so there were a couple years there where it was very, very intense, very stressful in our home. We didn't know what was going on with her. She was tantruming for 45 minutes at a time because we gave her the wrong color plate. Um, or I didn't brush her hair the right way or the clothes felt funny. And so through this process of figuring out what's going on, I, we met with a lot of therapists, psychologists, and I remember as a parent, at the end of frustration, asking them, what can I do when I get to this point? What can I do when I am so frustrated because I'm not in control of myself to be able to help my daughter who is physically not in control of herself? (laughs) And I was shocked at the answer I got. You know what she told me to do? Go hold an ice cube in my hand. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, okay. Okay. How is that going to solve anything? Well, it didn't, it didn't, but what it did was it spurred me on this journey to figure out how to help myself and other parents like me push through this. And so what I found is on a day-to-day basis, mindfulness is key. Mindfulness being present in the moment throughout the day, it really helps you move past these moments when you are feeling so stressed. 
in fact, there was a, a time when my brother came to visit me and my girls were tantruming right and left. And he's like, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. And I was like, it works. It works this mindfulness because what it allows you to do is it allows you to be in the moment, figure out what is going on in the moment and then move on to the next. So you're not holding on to all that stress and anxiety and pressure throughout the entire day. And it's not building up. And when the stress builds up and it constantly goes on top of each other, that's when we get to that boiling point where we just explode and we're yelling or, um, you know, however else you, you handle your stress. That mindfulness is huge. And that ice cube in the hand, I remember uh, <laughs> this is giving me flashbacks to like, like birthing classes before my kids were born. So, uh, you know, they had you hold the ice cube in the hand, especially the, the husbands, the male partners, boyfriend, husband, whatever. Because uh, it was like, this is not obviously the contractions are going to be more intense than this. But this is sort of like an analogy, right? Hold the ice cube in the hand. That ice cube takes all your attention because it's not comfortable it's borderline pain and you know that once you drop it you're going to be just fine right but it's like very uncomfortable to hold an ice cube in your hand and it really does kind of give you that mindfulness practice and I think there is something about that like the slight discomfort it's almost like a workout right mm -hmm. like when you're working out you're focused on that workout you're not thinking about a hundred other things so that's very interesting the ice cube so do you have do you have your clients kind of do the ice cube thing and you know, as part of the mindfulness training or how do you work, how do you work that in? Um, I don't actually, but it does, it shifts your focus from what is going on around you to what is going on internally. And that's the whole basis of mindfulness. You know, it's easy to start out with, you get out of in the morning before you even get out of bed. Okay. What does my body feel like? What does my head feel like on my pillow? What is, am I feeling warm or am I feeling cold under my sheets Are my sheets smooth or are they rough, you know, and kind of drawing in to start the day and then throughout the day. Okay. What do my feet feel like on the floor? What do my feet feel like in the shoes? What do my legs feel like while I'm sitting here in the chair? What do my hands feel like while I'm typing? What does the water feel like running down? And just all these little pieces throughout the day, 30 seconds at a time, it really, adds up and it really teaches your brain how to shift from everything that feels so big to what is going on right here and is truly manageable nice. and that's where I typically start with clients on the mindfulness piece nice and you know it's it's funny as you were talking that's something that that kind of happens automatically like when you go on vacation you know you like you've cleared everything you finished all your work and now you're in Hawaii or wherever you are you know Mexico and you're just sitting there and nobody has a problem like feeling, oh my gosh, the sun feels so good. Oh, oh yeah. the, co the cold drink in my hand feels so nice. And we get more tactile, more, you know, in our senses. Whereas, you know, if you've got a thousand things to do and only three hours to do it on a Tuesday afternoon, you know, we're all in our heads, right? We're not feeling, yeah. we're not, you know, enjoying the process. So um, yeah, I really like that. So handling stress in that way, so I would imagine this sort of takes care of the brain fog as well. Um, what about the fatigue? Do, do you find that just being present like that can definitely change how fatigued we are? It sort of like wakes us up, revitalizes our senses in a way. Well, it certainly can. Um, fatigue, I think, is a little bit harder egg to crack, <laughs> you know, because there's so many underlying root potential root causes for it, you know, in terms of hormonal imbalances, cortisol depletion, just depression, anxiety, neural inflammation is a big piece actually to all of them as well. Um, and so that's a little bit harder. It takes a little bit more time of rebalancing the body to kind of get the fatigue back in line. There's also like nutrient um, deficiencies that can contribute to fatigue as well as, you know, thyroid dysfunction and other things. So, um, for fatigue, typically we do a little bit more investigation. That's where the labs really become important. Um, functional medicine labs. I don't know if you've ever had them done, but they, they're much different than conventional yes. medicine labs. I have had them done one time. Yeah. yeah. They go a lot. Yeah. Uh, describe the difference a little bit because, uh, yeah, the markers are very different from sort of like a traditional lab and what they're looking for. Yeah. And so, you know, especially straddling both conventional medicine and functional medicine, for example, um, we'll take thyroid, you know, lots of people have heard of hypothyroidism or overactive thyroid, um, or underactive thyroid, and you get your labs and it's, 
the lab report will say from this to this is normal and you're within that normal range. So you're okay. You're not having any symptoms. Whereas functional med or your symptoms aren't related to your thyroid because it's related to, you know, you're within that normal range. Functional medicine takes it a little bit deeper. We say, okay, well, this is what the lab says is normal, but this is what's actually functionally normal. This is what your thyroid function is best at, is optimally functioning at. And so really this higher end or this lower end of what's considered laboratory normal may not actually be the best for you. And you may actually be having subclinical hypothyroidism or subclinical hyperthyroidism um, because you're outside of that functional range. Functional labs also like for thyroid, will just test like a TSH, which is a screening test, thyroid stimulating hormone. And if it's within range, we don't typically do T3, T4 um, thyroid antibodies and things like that. Whereas a whole panel is about seven labs and it digs a lot deeper. Again, it's looking for that subclinical piece where it's technically normal, but you really could be having early symptoms and early signs of hypothyroidism and they're right. just not going to show up in the conventional world. Right. Right. And you know what, I'm going to get a little bit on my soapbox here, but, um, or, you know, throw my opinion in here a little bit. Yeah. But what, what really bothers me about sort of conventional, uh, medical, you know, testing. One example is, is diabetes. So yes. I don't know the exact numbers, but I heard that they actually changed the parameters of what normal is just because so much of the population was in the diabetic range. And then they changed it to say, well, that's normal. And now, well, that's, we'll call it pre-diabetic instead of full-blown diabetes, right? And I have a big problem with that because I don't want to be lumped in this sort of like, oh, the average people, right? If 99% of people are eating poorly, not exercising, stressed out, we shouldn't make that the normal. We still need to keep the standard. So I feel like in a way they, they're sort of like lowering the standards as far as what we should be shooting for and saying, oh, it's okay. All your neighbors are, uh, you know, 50 pounds overweight too. So we're going to call that normal now. All your neighbors have high blood sugar. So we're going to call that normal now. But meanwhile, all these people are living in, like we said, the symptoms, fatigued all the time, stressed out, brain fog. Uh, when that doesn't have to be the case, right? So, so would you say like we're sort of dropping the standards in conventional medicine in a way? Um, well, I haven't heard specifically that, except for I've seen that in clinical practice, even like with my own father. So hemoglobin A1C is a blood test that is an average of three months of blood sugars and normal is less than 6.5 over 6.5 is considered diagnostic for diabetes. Um, if you're in like the 5.8 to 6.4 range, you're considered pre-diabetes. My dad, his A1C was 7.0 clearly in the diabetic range. And his doctor never told him never started him on medication. He should have been started on medication or had really dietary and lifestyle changes first, That's but right you know, back when his A1C was 6.4 and 6.5, she yeah. let it go all the way up to 7.0 before she even said anything. Wow. I think that's really failing people. An optimal A1C should be less than 5.3. And, and, and your dad was at seven. Four. And he was at seven. Wow. And, and see, this is where like, and this, this is where there's a big difference too, between conventional medicine and functional medicine. Uh, as far as I know, the only treatment that conventional medicine would give your dad at, at a 7.0 is insulin, right? Like what else do they do? Do they do anything else? I've oh yeah, 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 they do. Okay, okay. You, have to, you have to enlighten me because yeah. I'm, <laughs> okay, okay. So what, what, so let's say, let's say, let's, let's do this specific example then as far as like, let's say someone's at 7.0, mm -hmm. um, what are the differences between sort of how functional medicine would approach it versus more of the traditional medicine? How would they approach? Because Obviously, I just threw something out that maybe is not true. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm not a diabetic expert, but um, a, a functional approach, you know, when the A1C and the insulin levels, which we can also test with blood tests, start to creep up, you know, we're really heavy hitting hard lifestyle changes. You have to change your diet. You need to get on an anti-inflammatory, you know, um, whole food based diet and watch your portions, watching the sugars. 
um, limiting processed foods, all those, a clean diet and move your body every single day. Whether that's taking a walk, like an actual walk, not just a stroll, but like an actual walk, um, purposeful movement. It's good to be active throughout the day, but you need purposeful exercise as well. And what that does is that helps increase, um, decrease insulin resistance and makes your body more susceptible to the insulin. Insulin uh, sensitivity, right? You're insulin increasing sensitivity. insulin sensitivity. Yeah. Yes. Increase cool. insulin sensitivity and decrease insulin resistance. Um, and then in a conventional medicine world, oh, your A1C is starting to get up. You know, you're at 6.4. You need to start watching your sugar. That's what my dad was called. You need to cut out sugar. You need to stop eating sweets. That's what he thinks. He doesn't think that eating a bagel for breakfast with right. loaded cream cheese and a glass of orange juice is right. bad. Okay. Um, <laughs> he's, he's just thinking of sugar in terms he's of cakes, of muffins, yes. donuts, yes. as opposed to the high sugar, orange juice, bagel, tons of carbs. Yeah, I got yeah. it. Okay. Yep. And then you get put on metformin. And then after metformin, there are injectable medications that people can use outside of insulin that are very effective, um, as well as other pills. And then it becomes, a, you know, a tattering, uh, teetottering up and up and up because the more insulin resistance you get, the worse your diabetes gets, the easier it is to gain weight, the more insulin resistant you become yes. and the harder it is to lose weight. And so it becomes this negative cycle so downward. downward spiral. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Whereas uh, it seems to me that functional medicine is more like, all right, we are literally going to reverse this. Yes. And there's all kinds of steps that we need to take. Um, and like you said, like I would say most, I don't, I don't, I don't know the number, but I would say a lot of people would fall into that category where they don't realize that a bagel is extremely detrimental for your blood sugar and can just spike it through the roof. Right. Yeah. And, and different things like it. it doesn't have to be that donut, right. Or that pastry. It can yeah. be other sort of more common foods. Um, so we're getting to the, to the root inflammation. So you mentioned sort of a clean diet. How would you define clean just so people can have sort of like a, uh, like a very practical, like, okay, I should, I should aim to eat this, this, and this. Yeah. So, you know, I tell my clinic patients in cardiology clinic, but as well as my clients, the most important thing is eating whole foods whole foods. There's a variety of different diets out there from keto to vegan, to paleo, to, um, you know, this, that, and the other, that piece, you know, is different in that it helps with your metabolism and weight loss and pieces like that. But the most important thing is to eat organic as much as possible, farm raised without hormones, um, grass fed, just, kind of in a paleo kind of way, as, as clean as possible without any added preservatives, anything that comes in a box or a package, don't eat it. <laughs> right. Who, who packaged your food, mother nature or yeah. that person over there at the plant? Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah. If, if, if there has to be an ingredient list, then it's not natural. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I tell my clients that too, you know, you don't have to worry about calories when right. you're not having to read labels. If because it comes your with body. Labels, yeah. yeah. Your body will tell you when it's full, right? It's like, oh, we're good. You ate enough yeah. beef today or enough, whatever you ate. Yeah. 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 Good point. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's funny because you, I, I think with a lot of the diet culture, we vilify certain foods. And um, it's funny when I sort of like got past that and I realized that like, I, I eat a lot and I, I've actually sat down and eaten like four pounds. It's going to sound crazy, but I've eaten four pounds of berries in one sitting just because I like, like I started eating and I'm just like, my body really wants more of this. And I just kept eating, kept eating, felt fine. No sugar rush, no nothing afterwards. I don't know why I needed that many berries, but maybe I was low in something. Uh, but again, it's like, it, you don't have to look at the ingredients of it. It's just, it's a berry, you know, it's not like high fructose, blah, blah, blah. And you know, mm -hmm. all this stuff. So, um, yeah, very interesting. Um, Let's see. I think we covered all the bases. Is there anything else you wanted to say about inflammation specifically or generally that um, can help with symptoms like that? Yeah. So, you know, inflammation, I think, is the root cause of most disease. And I think in the limelight right now, COVID-19 and then brain fog is 
really prevalent. I hear a lot of my clients as well as patients um, having this as a concern. You know, I can't remember what I did yesterday. I can't remember what I went to the grocery store for if I don't have my list. Um, you know, I was supposed to do this and I completely forgot. Like this, I think we have to recognize is a sign of inflammation and our body is trying to tell us something. And so again, by focusing on the good lifestyle choices, eating a clean diet, eating an anti-inflammatory diet. So incorporating things like olive oil, um, omega-3 fatty acids are very anti-inflammatory fatty fish, that kind of thing is going to help reduce some of those symptoms, um, overall. Yeah. Awesome. So fat, fatty fish, like salmon and, and mackerel, yeah. sardines. Yep. Oh, I love sardines. They're the best. You do? I love sardines. My kids will eat sardines. Like we'll get the little can and they'll just. Really? Oh yeah. You, they love you it. You eat them on pizza? Uh, you know, I've never really had them on pizza. I just go, I just put them on a salad usually. Uh, okay. Yeah. You do them on pizza? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I eat salmon two to three times a week. That's how awesome. I get my <laughs> Perfect. Salmon. Oh, salmon's delicious. A little bit of lemon on top of it. So yeah. good. Yep. So uh, Sarah, I like to end every show with a chance for you to go really big picture, uh, okay. life principles, goal setting, things like that. But I want to put you in front of a, let's say a college graduation, and you're going to give a keynote speech on how you think they can get the most out of their lives. So like a motivational speech, um, you can kind of weave health into it, but, but try to go really big, more like the meaning of life type stuff. The meaning of life type stuff. Well, I think the things that we really need to focus on in life overall is finding joy and purpose. Um, from a health perspective, there are places called the blue zones in the world where people are living well past 100. And it is, people are trying to figure out what is going on. And one of the key themes in all the blue zones, aside from what they're eating, diet, that kind of thing, is that they all have purpose and find joy in their life every day. They laugh. They find time to spend time doing what they love, whether that's outside in nature hiking or refinishing furniture or playing with your kids. Whatever it is that gives you joy, you need to find joy every single day and make that a priority in your life. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, how yeah. do people get in touch with you? Um, website, social media? Yeah. So I'm under Peak Integrative Wellness is our company and we work with people from all over the world. It's a virtual practice. We're on Instagram. That's where we are most of all, but also on our website, um, peakintegrativewellness.com. We have a freebie download there talking about how to manage stress in a busy world, but also I'd like to offer your, um, your podcast listeners a special offer today. So we are doing DNA testing uh, with a consultation and interpretation for normally $600, but for your uh, special listeners, I'd like to offer it down to $550. So you can apply for that, either send me a DM on Instagram or through the website there. So really excited. That's great. Well, thank you so much for that offer. Appreciate it. That's, yeah. uh, and thank you for the conversation. This has been great. Again, this is Sarah Anderson, certified nurse, nurse practitioner and functional medicine health coach. I'm Chris Jenke for Health in the Real World. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Health in the Real World show. Make sure to like and subscribe and comment down below. Visit mycorebalance.com to learn more.